I'm going to come to you, uh, Vikram and Shrija as well, and this is to uh, both of you. Give us a sense of your own experience uh, in the United States of having built out a similar uh, program and uh, what your learnings thereof have been in, as far as collaboration between defense departments and startups is concerned. Now when you look back, what are some of uh, the sort of salient features of that program as far as creating a market for startups is concerned? Uh, so you know, as, far as, I, as far as I'm concerned, first of all, I want to thank everyone, thank the organizers, uh, the ministry, Invest India, uh, U.S. India Strategic Partnership Forum sees this innovation cooperation is actually fundamental to our national security. It's not just about uh, sparking innovation for innovation's sake. It's about making our country stronger and more secure. And I really want to thank the Indian entrepreneurs who are here tonight. I mean, how amazing that we have this incredible ecosystem already alive. And what the defense establishment is really trying to do is benefit from this ecosystem that is, uh, that is coming up on its own. Um, you know, far from being the, the source of, large source of revenue and potential for startups, the defense establishment and government in general is mostly viewed as quite the opposite. If you're a young startup and you're in your go-to-market phase, you are trying to become an unstoppable force, right? You're trying to get over this hump and get, to profit, get revenue and get to profitability. And as you're trying to become an unstoppable force, government has traditionally looked a lot like an immovable object. Uh, you would not want to go there. And what's happening now, because we have leaders like Joint Secretary Jaju, like Deputy Assistant Secretary Felter, um, and people that are creating these programs, is government is saying, well, wait a minute, we're not immovable. We have ways that we can bring your relevant technologies into this extraordinarily large, important, and important for the nation uh, market. And I think it's extraordinarily exciting to see what's happening right now. Um, but it's also just a start. We're, what we're doing now is figuring out how to pr get to the prototype stage. Um, but startups have only a few ways in, either through a major company, an Airbus or Lockheed being a partner, perhaps being a subcontractor to one of those companies, um, or through growing to a point at which they can invest in doing business with government. Shrija, uh, so she's a scientist on the panel and we were chatting earlier actually. And but So before we get your impressions on uh, startups and how the NASA works with them, you must tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you're doing at NASA. One of them is satellite traffic management. I mean, who thought that satellites would need traffic management soon? But apparently they do. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on this panel. It's, uh, this, this whole event is, is fantastic and a little intimidating, like uh, some of you pointed out. Um, so to touch on your question as well as uh, space traffic management, it's actually related because um, space traffic management is something that we're putting together, bootstrapping together at NASA Ames Research Center, uh, primarily so that startups and any players in the space industry can um, collaborate with each other, talk to each other, make decisions about which spacecraft goes up when and how they avoid collisions in space without act having to pick up the phone and talk. So we're trying to make this process as seamless as, um, and as autonomous as possible. Um, and what we're trying to follow the mantra, which is uh, structure where necessary and flexibility otherwise. So that you provide a ground where uh, new players can play without, without too much bureaucracy. Um, so to go on to your question, um, uh, NASA helps uh, startups and uh, small businesses in several ways. Uh, one is through direct funding. We have a program called Small Business Innovation Research Grants. Um, on an annual basis, they end up spending uh, about $150 million on more than 400 proposals. Um, and it, it leads to a lot of innovation, um, which is basically small businesses doing, uh, doing products which, uh, which are very, very innovative, but also in sync with NASA's uh, own, own research. And what we're trying to do is making sure that their product reaches the market and is, is scalable and, and repeatable, which, which NASA is not usually doing. Uh, another way is we advertise uh, programs that come up with new products uh, so that if there are if there are industry partners that want to make it, um, make it scalable, they can reach out and um, take NASA technology and, and make it scalable. Uh, there is 
There are several other programs that I can um, talk to you about, but essentially what we're trying to do is, uh, is recognizing that technology by definition is dynamic. It moves so fast that um, if we're in the government and we're siloed um, in, in bureaucratic procedures, uh, then we're not able to catch up with, with what's happening outside. Can you give us a sense of to what extent uh, NASA technology is open sourced in that sense to uh, startups that get incorporated into the program? Uh, and you know, how does that collaboration then work uh, outside of uh, serving certain needs that NASA might have? You know, which is a question of, you know, NASA can't be the business builder for these startups. The startups still have to figure out their business on their own. Right. So the way NASA works is we do things that the market cannot support. We are flying missions to Jupiter or Uranus looking for water on the moon because, because, the tech, because the market can't support ventures like that. When we realize that there is enough capability in the market to take care of things that we don't need to do, we immediately contract that out. So SpaceX was born this way and all of the other rocket companies uh, uh, came out that way. And I want to try and understand from both of your perspectives, Lockheed as well as uh, uh, Airbus, is, does it make sense for you guys to actually have uh, senior technical or non-technical folks from your companies go out to these educational institutions and actually kind of, you know, spark that seed of you can do something really interesting in the aerospace industry uh, with us. That's very true and that's something I think we've recognized and introduced into our India Innovation Growth Program by um, bringing in a university challenge element because we recognize that's where the ideas are formed and in fact we've seen you know from a student challenge uh, where we part of the program put out a, a challenge to all of the universities around the country, uh, we've seen startups come out of uh, some of these student challenges where you know, they've got the bug not just for the idea and the science and the technology, but also for the business angle, which we've tried to inculcate as well as part of the program. So yes, we would say that's a very important uh, connection uh, with the, you know, academia, uh, government and industry get together uh, really through this program, mm. uh, through University Challenge and the Startup Challenge. Anand, from your perspective? Great. Uh, well, um, it's a little bit of a cycle and let me explain what I mean by that, right? We obviously have been in India for a long time, so we've got a partnership with the Indian Institute of Science and all the IITs and we do challenges and competitions and we do grants and scholarships and also we are middlemen in terms of uh, connecting Indian Institute of Science with the French universities or the European universities or, or with the, the Chinese, so on and so forth. So it's, it's a network that we are trying to create which brings in a lot of ideas and uh, uh, all of that. But it's also a feeder pool for us to get talent into our company from the IITs. But what's interesting is it's not just what you get in but what you push out. Oh. It's also that how do we as Airbus or I used to work for Lockheed or you know uh, any of the large companies not squelch and choke creativity uh, after people come in and after the ideas come in and that's why BizLab we don't want BizLab, Airbus BizLab to sit anywhere on an Airbus campus or close to us they have to be away from us how much of a challenge did you see it when you were starting out to uh, you know have some sort of seed capital to get going and you know before biz labs happened to you uh, you know did you seriously think of you know hey even if you took it to a certain stage were vcs angel investors biting was it you know not clickbaity enough G tell us a little bit about that part of it uh, we are a b2b startup so when we started initially uh, this was 2014 2015 and majority of the funding was going to b2c uh, B2C companies because of the you know hyper local uh, wave going on. So uh, initially there were few VCs or few people who uh, we, we could f out of ten maybe two or three VC groups were investing into B2B kind of startups. But over last uh, one and a half to two years we see that uh, changing. It has pretty evolved now. You you would see five to six VCs out of ten who would be willing to look at B2B startups. So, so this evolution has happened over the last 18 to 24 months, which is a good thing for us and, as, uh, and for companies uh, you know, who are 
planning to cater to defense sector, to aviation sector, are mostly going to be B2B. And with VC, uh, VC uh, fraternity uh, opening up to B2B startups, that is really a good news for startups like us. So that has changed for good now. 